No Roxbury, Massachusetts, a Musul, Iraq, aho. Ko Fort Hill, te Mangwa. Ko Nahar Dijla, te Awa. Ko Ziad Hopkins, Toko Ngoa. Norera, Tenakotu, 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 Kotoa. I am so humbled to be standing here in front of so many of you. I'm looking from the back of the room to the front of the room. And I'm just really kind of overwhelmed with the support that I'm feeling, not only personally, but professionally in the back. Our Fulbright hosts coming up, my Fulbright colleague, Haley, people from Ministry of Social Development, from SIFS Youth Justice, from the courts, from the Ministry of Justice, and of course, my family here in the front row, my wife Michelle and my daughters Nadia and Zaina. Um, it really is, it has been a fantastic seven months and I couldn't have done it without you. I feel like the last seven months I've been like a sponge, just getting information from you, getting challenged by, by your work and by, your, by our conversations. And I hope today, try to squeeze some of that back out, maybe distill it, and give my own take and viewpoint on it. And to be clear, as was said in the earlier, my co-papa, sort of where I stand, my point of view, I think that might be my favorite Maori word. Um, I am a public defender. I am a defense attorney. That is my lens. And I hope that when you hear this point of view, you can consider it as you move forward in trying to renew, revise, and improve the youth justice sector here. I know that I have a lot to take back to Massachusetts, and I've completely enjoyed my time here. Um, I have been lucky in the last 10 years practicing in the United States in what we still call juvenile justice. We don't call it youth justice. <coughs> juvenile justice sector there, that we've been in what they call the fourth wave of juvenile justice. It's the wave marked by the United States Supreme Court cases of Roper, um, Graham, and Sullivan. These Supreme Court cases reestablish that, surprise, surprise, kids are different, <laughs> right? We sort of forgot about that in the United States for a long, long time. And really in the last 10 years, from the, from the highest court down to the lowest court, there's been a process of reevaluation. And you see that not only in juvenile justice, but also criminal justice. I'm sure you're all aware of the news of um, what's going on in Ferguson and Baltimore and so on. And you hear politicians speaking about needing to reform uh, criminal and juvenile justice. So I feel this is sort of a special moment to be here in New Zealand. And it's particularly special because you in New Zealand are also going through a reevaluation of the youth justice sector. And I'm honored to have been a, a part of that reevaluation um, and to try to understand what the role of the youth advocate <coughs> is and how it might be expanded and how increased opportunities for meaningful access to counsel could help uh, shore up or re reinvigorate the rights basis of the youth justice model, as well as maintaining the focus on positive youth development that is such an important part of the youth justice sector here. Um, in today's report, uh, report back, I'm going to do a case processing overview. I'm looking out over here and I see so many experts here, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And if I get something wrong, jump in, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to go over the whole act, we'd be here all day. But just to try to give some context, we can talk so we, we can get to the point where I can discuss my recommendations or ideas or things that, that should be considered here in New Zealand. And so briefly touch also on the, the importance of rights and positive youth development in youth justice. And then talk about the role of youth advocates as I see it currently here in, in New Zealand as it's practiced but also inform from my own experience as a practitioner and sort of how, how I would imagine myself practicing this environment. And trust me, I would love to practice in this environment and there were times when I was observing things where I just couldn't stop my, I was holding myself down and not to stop myself from jumping in. Um, so there are a lot of great things about it. So it sort of, I bring that, that point of view. And then I want to finally just talk about the opportunities to increase meaningful access as a way to fill in what I think are some, some gaps in the rights of young people in this, in, in, in this system. There are, of course, trade-offs in all of this, and these are trade-offs that will have to be considered by you here in New Zealand. So I come with this point of view, not really constrained by budget, although I try to keep that in mind and try to be practical about things, but ultimately 
it, it's not my decision, it's not my choice, but hopefully you will, you will consider these thoughts as you move forward. And then, of course, the time for questions and comments. Um, I did manage when I was here to really immerse myself in the youth justice sector. I, w I tried to sort of come, come at it from making sure to s at least touch on every aspect of a young person's journey through the system. So through my kids, I had the schools. So I kind of got a sense of what family life is for, for kids in, in, in New Zealand. That was a great asset. Um, but also what community-based organizations, courts, uh, police, how do police interact with young people? So shadowing police with SIFs, youth justice coordinators, national policy makers, supervisors, youth justice residences, um, the Rangatahi court, really trying to get exposure to as much as different of the, of the daily activity of what goes on in youth justice. And of course, being involved in the YCAP symposiums, being involved in meetings, and just generally trying to become at one with the youth justice sector here. I'm not sure I totally got there. In some ways, I feel like I'm just hitting my stride now, but I think that's why I have to come <coughs> back, just, just so you know. <laughs> um, so I want to just do a quick case processing overview, and I do this just so I can point out the areas that I think that, 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 that are where I have my suggestions about how improved access to counsel could benefit young people and the youth justice sector as a whole. And in the spirit of youth participation, I'm gonna ask my kids to help out just so we can sort of visualize this a little bit. So, Zaina, this is my younger daughter Zaina, this is my older daughter Nadia, okay? I don't know, can you see this? So, the four areas in yellow are what we're gonna talk about towards the end of the, uh, the, the end of the, the presentation. I kind of just want to sort of visualize like how does a young person move through the system and how might they be feeling through the system. Always starts with an allegation that a young person committed a crime. Notice I'm a defense lawyer, I said allegation, just, just in case you didn't pick that up, <laughs> right? <laughs> allegation. The New Zealand police can arrest or not arrest, but they investigate and this is where the questioning of the young person happens. This is an area I think there might be some room for, for some things to be done to help about protect young people's rights in that section. Now, Zaina wasn't arrested. Thank goodness. <laughs> if she, so she's not arrested, she goes home. Poor Nadia, she got arrested. Okay? Nadia is arrested. The police have to make a decision. Do I detain? Do we detain? Do we release on, ba do we release on some sort of bail conditions? And then eventually end up in court depending on whether she was detained or whether she was sent home to come back to the next youth court session, um, there can be a gap between when she actually gets connected with a youth advocate. When she shows up in youth court, she gets her youth advocate. At that point, it's in court. We are now in the formal side of youth justice. All the pomp and circumstance. We have Judge Beecroft here, you know, with the black robes and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, at this point, she can, with her lawyer, decide what she wants to do with the case, including saying, you know what, I think I want a family group conference to try to resolve this matter. I could push it to trial, I could try to fight these charges, but really I want to plead not denied, which is the most brilliant phrase ever, to plead not denied, I love it, um, and see if we can resolve it in a family group conference. Now the family group conference is something that happens throughout the youth justice system. It's used both to make de decisions about detention, about whether the case gets transferred to adult court, about whether court orders are issued, um, all sorts of things and at different phases. Of course, for those of us on the outside, the Family Group Conference is sort of iconic as restorative justice. I know there's controversy over that. I figured that out when I showed up here. Not necessarily restorative justice. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm going to kind of just be, you know, blunt about it. In the end, I was really struggling with that. And I said, you know what? I don't really care if it's restorative justice or not. I know that it can't, that restorative justice in the sense of repairing the harm, allowing a young person and the victim to meet and to try to come to some sort of resolution, to figure out ways to reintegrate a young person into the community, that can happen in a family group conference. 
certainly more so than in any context in the United States, in any sort of normal crim youth justice process in the United States. But it's not necessary, it's not required, sometimes it might not even be appropriate, but it can happen in that space, um, in, in, the, in the family group conference space. So that's Nadia, she's had a lawyer, she got arrested, she has a lawyer. Poor little Zaina. Good she didn't get arrested, right? We like that. That's a good thing. However, now the police have to make a decision through the youth aid. Do we just let it go? Non-interventionist, right? That's sort of one mode of thought. Just don't intervene. Don't do anything. Everything's going to be okay. Or do we provide some, do we offer an alternative action, which is basically police-led diversion? Do we figure out a way just between the police and Zaina and her father and mother, family, Fano, can we work out a, so a solution to what she's alleged to have done? No lawyer here, so there's no mediation, direct between the police and the young person. If you can't work something out, if the plan doesn't work out, or the police don't think it's too serious, they can have an intention to charge family group conference, which is just like the family group conference that Nadia went through, except from a youth advocate perspective, the only difference is there's no YA here, no, no youth advocate. Functionally, in terms of how it's run, it's the exact same, just there's no youth advocate. And the question is, can you resolve the matter before formal charges? This here is the informal, what I see sort of as the informal youth justice space. But it's all youth justice. It's just whether it's formal or informal. Okay, so Zaina and Nadia, we sort of got the two people. So although Nadia has the disadvantage of being in the formal justice system, she's got a lawyer. Zaina's got the, I'm informal, things are good, but, it, um, uh, but I don't have a lawyer. So maybe that's an issue, maybe it's not, and that's sort of the, 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 question, <coughs> the question to ask. Um, in a way, coming to New Zealand as an outsider, I look at this space over here, and a little bit over here, but really I'm talking about this sort of informal space of resolution, and it's what we all want. Informal is good, divert, keep out of court. But it's almost like we're in this quandary where New Zealand is so successful at keeping these numbers down. We don't have very many Nadias, got a lot more Zainas over here. is that youth justice is really happening in the informal space. Where you don't necessarily have the transparency and oversight that you have in the green boxes. So what do you do with that? Because you want to keep the, the benefits of the informality, but you also want to make sure that, the, that people's rights are being uh, respected in that process. So there's a part of me that sort of looks at this, and it's not quite the same thing, but for those of you who know the, the Supreme Court case of In re Galt, you know, it's the case that ushered in in the U.S. the second wave of juvenile, just, court, juvenile justice about the right to counsel. And you sort of read that, and I'm looking at it, I'm saying, why is this rhetoric so familiar? And they talk about the harms of informal processes leading to punishment. Now, I will admit the punishment in there was incarceration, so it was much extreme. That's not even close to happening over here. But there is state intervention. There is, from a young person's perspective, I'm getting punished. It's not, it's not jail, it's not prison. I'll be the first to admit that. So it's a huge, it's, it's quite different in that sense. But from a young person's experience of the system, that's what it feels like to them. <coughs> so, the challenge then is to try to find a way to, is there a way or what is the cost of strengthening rights in that for informal system without losing the benefits of the informality? And, how, you know, and what are the payoffs of, of doing that? So what do we mean by rights? I sort of use that and you know, I think people all have a sense but I just want to take a pause and just sort of remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about rights when somebody is accused of a crime. So they're best summed up in the United Nations uh, <coughs> Convention on the Rights of Children, UNCROC, 
Um, I am ashamed to say that the United States is the only country in the world not to have signed that convention, so I'm not here to preach, certainly. It's embarrassing. Um, even Somalia signed a, a few months ago, so we are now <laughs> all alone. Um, but we're talking about the right to put the government to proof, the presumption of innocence, the right to silence, the right to challenge procedures, the right to confront and present evidence, to confront witnesses and present evidence, the right to participate in your defense, the right to participate in what's happening to you, as well as the right to legal representation. So these are the rights we're talking about, which is how are these rights honored in the informal system, and how do we make sure that, they're, that they are still uh, kept alive to the extent that they need to be. This is coupled with what some people call positive youth justice, which is a way of sort of thinking about positive youth development in the context of youth justice, of people involved in youth justice. Now, I know there's many people in the room here who are like, yes, <laughs> and certainly, I know when I was walking, talking to people in New Zealand, this is just like par for the course. Yes, young people need good relationships. Yes, young people need opportunities. Yes, the young people need engagement. And this sort of changing the frame, thinking of youth as a resource, not as villains or as victims, but th they have strengths. It's a strength-based model. We believe in the resilience. We believe that character is malleable. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but that the character is still forming, the brain is still developing, and there is, and, and, and culpability means something different for young people than it does for adults. And so we talk about interventions here it's about skill development, attachment, engage and engagement. I have to say, coming here, as I said, in the U.S., it's known, and there's this, this chart is from a, from a U.S. academic, Jeffrey Butts, who some of you may know, um, but it's not integrated or spoken of in the way it is here in the youth justice sector. Um, so it was very refreshing to sort of be at, the, uh, be at that level. So with those sort of twin frameworks, and I know that not all kids fall in all those sort of rights and, and positive youth development, how do we make sure that both of those goals can be met as we move forward? I talk to a lot of people about how they perceive the role of the youth advocate, both youth advocates as well as other people. What makes a good youth advocate? Um, how, do they, how do they work in the youth justice sector? And again, like I said, sort of based on my own experience representing young people, I've sort of laid my own, th this, this is how I think the, the best practices for uh, youth advocates are. But this is based on essentially what I heard from people. And just for, for my ease, I broke it into three categories, legal, restorative, and equitable. Legal is what everyone thinks about when they think of lawyers, you know, on TV. Filing the motions, objecting, shouting, checking the evidence, uh, making sure police fo follow procedures, and so on and so forth. This is, you know, for, to be very shorthanded about it, a check on the police. The police want to prosecute somebody, we're, we're going to make it hard for them. Or we want to make sure that they're doing their job. We don't want to, um, when they're doing that. Restorative is a little bit different because here we're talking about the family group conference. The maybe restorative justice, maybe not. But people really want it to be restorative justice. And that's definitely the, 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 the sense that I get. Uh, Youth advocates want victims to be present because they feel they get better outcomes for their young people, for their clients when that happens. They're not trying to avoid it, they're not trying to duck it. They see that this makes, makes a difference. In the restorative aspect, uh, there's also a recognition that it can be difficult for young people to get through that process. It requires a, a level of skill and understanding and sometimes even development and even self-awareness to get through a process where, in a family group conference, with the entitled members, you have police who has the prosecutorial, um, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, uh, duty to make sure of the public interest and to represent the community in that. You have SIFS, the, the youth justice social worker, who's both a facilitator, but also has his or her own uh, priorities in mind. Um, you have the, the young person's own family, the victim, other community members. That is a lot to process for a young person in terms of reading body language, reading cues, 
planning what to say, having sort of the social skills to work through what is, even for adults, a very difficult emotional process. And <coughs> youth advocates talk about wanting to make sure that their young people get the absolute benefit from these, from these processes, from the FGCs. Because without it, it feels as though they're, they're, they're shirking their duties. Um, and so if you think about the legal process as being a check on the police, in some ways the restorative process is a check on SIFs, on the Youth Justice Coordinator. It's about making sure my client gets the best out of the FGC. And equitable, I know that in a lot of the restorative justice literature, the idea of sort of similar punishment and similar responses to similar crimes and similar situations doesn't quite fit because restorative justice is all about individualized and the, 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 the small community that's formed in that room to make, um, to make the decision about what to do. But to the extent that we're talking about a state-run system, the idea of, of equity across young people and across regions has a value. So there's that level of it, and a youth advocate can play a role and make sure that some, some young person is not getting hammered in a plan and say, wait a second, that, that's too much. Let's, ba let's back off on that. As well as just in the process itself, making sure that the, that the young person is not bullied. So then the question is, yeah, but why do you need a lawyer for all that, right? I mean, you have the YJ coordinator, you, you've got the police, legal stuff, that's just, you know, you could just get a hire, a, hire a lawyer to look through that. An equitable, well, we'll work that out. And that, that, that's an interesting, it's an interesting idea and one I think t to grapple with. But I think there's something, and maybe I'm just trying to make myself feel better, but there's something special about lawyers. <laughs> 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 um, and it's this, it's, it's in section 324 of the act. The idea of, you know, it's written in this very, the, the, the lawyer has all, has all the rights and privileges and must act as if he or she was hired by the child. In other words, you are the young person's lawyer. You work for that young person. There's a duty to that young person. And there's something in my experience representing young people as well as seeing people in the courts that's very em that can be very empowering to a young person to know that there is an adult in the room whose duty is completely 100% devoted to them. And that is a really hinges on the lawyer-client confidentiality. The ability to have conversations, which can be had with other people, but the protection of the lawyer-client relationship is one that I think really enhances that, that ability. For those of you who might be lawyers in the room, but certainly for myself, I have had the most intense <coughs> conversations and had people reveal information to me that they don't even allow me to reveal to somebody and I have to be a keeper of a secret. But it's important to sort of understand how to help and counsel that young person through what can be a very complicated bureaucracy, even one that's extremely well-intentioned and everyone wants the best thing for a young person. So it's a very powerful <coughs> responsibility. And I think of, and you can see it in, in, in here in New Zealand in a way, is I kind of perceive representation in this context as youth participation. Because in order to do this, you have, in order to work with a client and take instruction from, instruction from them, you need to collaborate. And so, I've really enjoyed being at the Ministry of Social Development in, in the Youth Policy Wing and hearing a lot about civics. And I had like, oh, whatever, civics. I'm here for you know, defense stuff. But it really started to make an impression on me and how important that is, how youth participation is important generally for the youth population. But that same value applied to youth justice, to, to children and young people in youth justice, is extremely powerful. And why that's powerful? Because if young people feel that they're participating in the response to their alleged offending and trying to make decisions about how to cope with it, it feels fair. You may not always get substantive fairness. You don't have to tell me as a lawyer. I've lost. I've had things happen that I think are unfair. But if the process is fair and somebody feels that they, were f that, that they had a fair shake and they understood what was going on, they're more likely to accept the outcomes. And I know early in my earlier in my stay here, I had a great conversation with, with Michael Doolin, who I know most of, who a lot of you know, and talked about this idea from a social work lens, which is if people consent to the treatment, it's going to be successful. So there is this sort of special place that youth advocates can play in 
getting young people engaged in treatment or engaged in a response. Um, and it's a fine line because you can't substitute your own views for, for, for what you think is best for the young person, but it can, it can be worked out. So with that sort of overview and, and hope for this is, this is what youth advocates can do in this system, where are there opportunities to incre increase meaningful access to counsel, right? If we accept that it's good for kids to have this relationship, that this relationship when they're going through what is a legal process, it may be informal but it's still legal, if this relationship is good, are there ways that we can find opportunities for young people to engage in that relationship that would be beneficial to them from a positive youth development perspective as well as support their rights? And so I want to talk about these uh, and sort of explain why I think they're important to at least consider. So legal advice and oversight at the alternative action stage. I know that this is, this, I'm from the United States, right? It's a different relationship to police. I've been challenged. I will be the first to admit it, to try to understand what is it like to sort of have police as allies in this situation. And I have been impressed with, with a lot of the youth aid officers and how imbued with youth development principles they are, how patient they can be with young people in a way that you don't necessarily see all the time in a youth justice system. It's not uniform, but you see it and it's impressive. But interventions are quite similar to FGC plans. They can be quite comprehensive. Some of them can be very straightforward and simple, but there can be a lot there. But I think we have to remember that that interaction between the police and a young person and their family when deciding whether to engage in alternative action in diversion, there is sort of an inherent coercive dynamic there. And I think to ignore it and pretend that it's not there doesn't do anybody uh, any favor any favors. There are ways to minimize it. And so the suggestion here is if you can give young people an ability essentially to say, I'm not so sure about this alternative action. Maybe I'm not sure that I, I don't really think I'm guilty. Maybe I don't really think that it's fair, that the program is fair. Maybe I want to negotiate. How do I do this? The ability to sort of get a second opinion from a youth advocate, I think could be quite helpful. And there is some legal support for this, for this process. The UN documents that, that talk about diversion, both the Beijing rules as well as the 2007 comments um, on, on UNCROC, talk about the difficulties in, and the importance of protections in, the, in, this pre in this diversion space. So the Beijing rules talk about that this consent for diversion should not be left unchallengeable since it might sometimes be given out of sheer desperation on the part of the juvenile. And then the, com the 2007 comments in paragraph 7 say, the child must be given the opportunity to seek legal or other appropriate assistance on the appropriateness or desirability of the diversion offered by competent authorities. And also recommends powers of police prosecutors and other agencies uh, to make decisions in this regard should be regulated and reviewed. Now you don't want to just <coughs> transform a formal system onto this because then you've just thrown the baby out with the bathwater. You know, the, the what's the point? You might as well just send everyone to court, but we know we don't want to do that. So how do you sort of limit that? And I think just giving children through a process information. This is your, I'm the youth aid officer. You're the local youth advocate. You can call this youth advocate if you have questions about this. There's usually a few, a few weeks before an alternative action plan gets put in place. There's time for the young person to do that and their family if they want to. And given what I've seen about the cooperation between youth advocates and youth aid officers, they can, they can work out a lot of stuff informally on the phone. For youth I've heard a number of cases where youth advocates call up a youth aid officer, you don't have anything here, what do you think you're doing? Or vice versa, hey, what do you think about this program or this plan? and they can work something out. So I think there's value, there can be a value to that. And again, it promotes procedural justice and youth participation and could possibly also encourage early exits from the youth justice system. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is that for adults in New Zealand who engage in, in diversionary programs, the police guidelines for diversion for adults explicitly says they should consult with a duty, have the opportunity to consult with a duty solicitor 
before accepting it, and this is because we want to make sure we have transparency about the program. So if we accept that children are vulnerable and need greater protections, it seems as though they should have some access to legal advice in this space. So the next space, if you remember those yellow boxes that Zaina was stuck in earlier, earlier in this, is the intention to charge family group conference. Um, this has been a long-standing desire for many people in the youth justice system. Uh, people have made the arguments. I came here, I heard the arguments, they seem to make sense to me. I, I don't need to repeat them in detail here, um, but a lot of the stuff about the, the from applies to alternative action also applies here. But one of the things that I want to th point out is in the report I had a chance in, in the in, in during my fellowship I had a chance to sort of follow an intention to charge conference and sort of see how it played out an intention to charge conference without a lawyer. And if you look at the report I'm not going to go through the whole details but coming from my eye I saw that there were some legal issues that could have been raised I'm not saying they would have been won, or if the young person even would want to push them, but they were there. And my position is a young person should be allowed to consider those to decide how they want to go forward in the case. This is one of the ways to cope with the situation, and they should have the autonomy to make that decision. And then there were issues sort of on the restoration side, sort of a lack of participation in the FGC. And in fact, there was a sort of indication that um, Everyone wanted to see how this young person actually performed in the FGC because there was an inclination to file charges as part of the plan, but they wanted to see how did the performance go. So that's something that I think if there was a youth advocate, there could have, been, there could have possibly been a different outcome in terms of uh, helping the young person prepare for that. Um, and I don't know if having a youth advocate at the ITC would have helped in that situation. What I do know, and this was after, in fact, I the, the report was written, what I do know is that the young person's response and reflection on this experience points to the importance of procedural justice and how the lack of it can really poison the well for young people. And I don't think that's something that anyone wants to do. You want people as much as possible to come through the system and feel well. And I understand you're not going to get 100% compliance. So this little example is, is an example, it's an anecdote, but it's one that I think we sort of need to, to consider seriously. So this young person wrote, in reflecting on the experience, an FGC, so this was with sort of an uncounseled FGC, an FGC is where you discuss your crime and, inverted quotes, agree on the consequences. But yet if you don't agree, you will get taken back until you pretty much say yes. And then later reflects, personally, it's done nothing for me but make me frustrated and destroyed my friendships. This plan has given me a negative mindset towards the police, SIFs, and social workers. So I know that's just one case, but that's sort of like the, the warning. We don't want that to happen. And I don't know if an if a if a attorney in that ITC would have made a difference. I can't, I can't predict that. But one would hope in best practices that could have made a difference. That could have been sort of a backstop to, to what else was going on. So the next two, uh, the, the other point that I sort of want to point this out, and this came out in Judge Beecroft's recent opinion about uh, counsel at ITCs, is there is sort of an issue of equity here. I, I think that there are families who recognize the value of having a youth advocate at, a, at an ITC. And if they've got the social or financial capital, they get one. So what, is that t what, I what does that say for the young people who, who don't have that option? I know that life is unfair, you know, and sometimes that happens, but I think it's something to consider. So th the next point where I think more meaningful access to counsel could help young people is around the issue of police interviews. And I'm sort of reflecting and hearing what I've heard from the youth justice sector. So I know that there are a set of rules that police try to follow and that the courts enforce and they're working off the set of rules. So the question here is not whether or not um, 
the police are necessarily following those rules or not following those rules. The question is whether, as a policy question, we think those rules are enough. And you know, and that, that, that's a values judgment. <coughs> do we want young people to truly understand their rights, uh, or not to say truly understand their rights, do we want to give the best opportunity for young people to understand their rights? The, the youth justice sector has noted concerns about the, the use of nominated persons. In New Zealand, a young person is entitled to have a nominated person advise them and help them decide whether or not to speak to the police during an interview. And they can in fact call a lawyer through the police detention legal assistance uh, scheme. What we, do, what, what we do know is that police talk to young people in the vast majority of cases, which of course from one point of view is just good police work. Right? We also know that young people submit to those, to those interviews in the vast majority of cases. That was the estimate that I got. I knew people were concerned about this issue, so I just kind of asked whoever I came across, how often do you think young people are making statements to police? And it pretty much came out to about 80% or so. And I certainly saw it in almost all the cases that, that I observed or came across or reviewed in terms of looking at files. We also know that young people don't call for legal advice. Is that good or bad? Well, you know, that's, I suppose that's a value judgment. We do know that they call a lot less than adults. When I looked at the billing records for Wellington, young people called, called for legal advice in 0.5% of the offenses. Eight young people over a course of a year, over 1,500 offenses. So it's not 1,500 different people, 1,500 offenses. So it could be, there's a lot fewer people than that. But the police only record by offenses. So I just compared it to offenses. It's not much better for adults, but it's significantly better. 7.5% for adults. So a 15 times difference, still not that high, but clearly for young people it's a much more difficult um, call to make, so to speak. So if we want to make sure that young people understand their rights, the most straightforward way is to, make, is to insist on having a youth advocate present during any interview that's going to be used for a admissible statement. Now I know that there are some who will say, well then they're just going to clam up, right, because that's the default legal advice. Be quiet when the police question you, which is true. I'm not going to lie here. But I also think that there's something sort of special about the New Zealand youth justice system because there is a space for this restoration. There is a space for young people to be...